Aloha everyone. Since our refuge volunteer meeting was postponed due to the COVID-19 restrictions, I thought I'd record the talk that I was due to give you as a Nature Nugget speaker a week or two back. Although it's not live, so there's no chance for you to interact or ask questions, I hope that the slides and the information will give you a few smiles uh, in the current situation. I was on Midway for six weeks from mid-December through the end of January this year. Three weeks as one of the albatross nest counters and a further three weeks volunteering with Fish and Wildlife on a variety of their projects. I flew on the dedicated Midway charter from Honolulu to Henderson Airfield on Midway. It's about 1,300 miles or so and takes about three to four hours, depending on which direction you're going and how strong the wind is. This was our transport. It's just a small nine-seater jet that flies to the island once every two weeks, which is why we have to return from the island in small groups of four or five over several weeks to allow seats for fish and wildlife service use. This is what Midway Atoll looks from, like from above. There are three islands, Sand Island on the left where all the buildings and the active airport are, Eastern Island where the World War II runways are still almost visible, and Tiny Little Spit. I wish we could see this from the air, but we have to fly in and out during night hours to avoid any bird strikes. So this is what it looks like when we arrive at our barracks, and this was the view from my bedroom window. And this is what it looks and sounds like during the day. The whole of Midway Atoll is a national wildlife refuge. It's also within the marine national monument of Papahanao Mokuakea, which extends out to 200 miles around the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. It is, of course, the site of the famous World War II Battle of Midway, and there are many monuments and memorials dotted around the atoll, as well as some remaining naval buildings, many of which are condemned or in poor repair. While we were there, the staff and volunteers gathered for their regular group photo for publications. There are only three full-time Fish and Wildlife Service employees. Those are the three brown shirts on the left at the back. Um, two extra volunteers next to them who are there, I think, were there for a year. And then there are four six-month volunteers. They're the ones standing in the middle. And three annual kupu. That's part of the same kupu program we have here on Kauai. However, there's also a large group of Thai workers employed by a company called Chugash, and they maintain the infrastructure and services. There's a chef, housekeeping, engineers, electrician, plumber, etc., and three FAA employees in charge of the airfield. The first day for nest counters is almost taken up with getting settled, which includes going to transportation and being assigned our bikes, followed by an orientation meeting at the Fish and Wildlife Service office. In the afternoon, the first time counters were shown how the counting protocol works and got to practice in one area of the island, while returning counters like myself got straight on with the job somewhere else. Meals are buffet style in Clipper House, awesome selection of Thai and Western cuisine. We certainly don't go hungry there. This is a view from Clipper House, one of several albatross runways down to the ocean. If you hang out near the shoreline, you can watch the parade of albatross plodding down the sand for a running takeoff. And some attempts are more successful than others.
This final clip was taken at sunset with a, a storm raging off to the west of us. There are very few spaces on the island that are not filled with nesting albatross, just like this. This is the field outside our barracks at dawn. And the same area with an afternoon rainbow. And here's what it sounded like and looked like on a very windy day. When we were counting albatross nests, these days we have an increasingly difficult challenge because of the bone in petrels. Midway is their only breeding ground and they are a great success story, having recovered in huge numbers since the rat eradication on the island many years ago. However, they are a burrowing bird and the number is so great now that it's almost impossible to avoid dropping into their burrows quite often. You can see many entrances here, but they tunnel for some distance quite shallowly under the, the surface, so the surrounding ground is very unstable. So this is our current solution, burrow shoes, aka adapted or homemade snowshoes. The orange ones are actually kids' snowshoes. They started experimenting last year with plywood squares and ski fastenings you can see bottom right. One person even nailed some trainers to bucket lids, but I prefer the shape of the kids' snowshoes, those orange ones, and more of those are on order for next season. Here's another view of the uneven ground from years of burrowing bone-ins. The building in the distance is the old radar station. That's the high point of Midway. It's only about 42 feet. This map shows Sand Island divided into the counting sectors. There are 50 of them as old buildings and landmarks and roadways that were used to divide up the sectors before disappear under vegetation it's sometimes very tricky to identify the sector lines so we have a number of markers to help us some are permanent and some we put in place at the beginning of the count these are some permanent hobo marks which are useful on some of the remaining tarmac uh, sector 50 is the entire runway area and several roads or used to be roads take off from that area so this is a, an example of the hobo marks that you can see. Where we don't have any tarmac or obvious landmarks it's a bit more tricky. We remove the flags you see on the left at the end of each count but the stamped concrete blocks can remain all year though often after a year they've either been overgrown by an alpaca or fallen into a bone and burrow. All the sector points are also stored as GPS waypoints so we can find them more easily each season. After the season's count, we painted those red blocks that you see on the right, which we scavenged from the boneyard and placed at various locations along sector lines that were the most difficult to locate this year. As well as counting on Sand Island, we made several boat trips over to Eastern Island. Again, that island is divided into sectors. It usually takes about two, two and a half days to count. Some days are rougher than others, in fact we had to revise our schedule several times during the count because the wind and swells were too strong to get over there. When we go, we go over for a full day, which means packing food and water. There's no shortage of great lunch spots. On Eastern we see many great frigate as well as red-footed and brown boobies. We have to watch for the ground nesting brown boobies so we don't disturb them and their chicks like this one. So I'm afraid this photo is rather grainy because I had to zoom in so far with my phone. I took this 360 video of Eastern uh, just so that you could get an impression of how the entire island is covered by albatross. The tarmac remnants that you see are the remains of the old World War II runways. Some non-nesters, probably juveniles, will find an egg substitute, like this small white buoy, for nesting practice. 
At various stages, the group stops to record our individual counts. Then we reset our tallywhackers, one for Laysan and one for Blackfoots. And as an extra safety check, two group members both record the numbers in separate books and verify with each other before we continue. This was at the end of our final counting day on Easton. As well as this team of seven in the photo, there was another team of six. In the past, there have been 18 counters with four established leaders and 12 others. Sadly, with a smaller plane these days and only one flight every two weeks, that had to be reduced to 12 and is likely to remain so, though we were lucky to gain a 13th this season when one seat on the plane became available at the last minute. We were waiting for the boat to collect us from Easton when we were buzzed by this inquisitive black noddy. And on the very last day of counting, a few of us rode over in the boat to count spit. And what a sad sight that was. During one of the many storms we had during our stay, the swells got up to an astonishing 40 feet, overwashed almost the entire tiny island. Hundreds of nests were destroyed. Many of the displaced nesters were gathered together in groups like this on the shoreline. Typically, we count somewhere near to 2,000 active nests on spit. This year, however, by the time we got there, we counted just less than 200. We keep track of the sectors we've counted by filling in this map. There's a copy in Clipper House and another in our barracks. As we complete a sector, it's highlighted until the entire map is filled in. The count results are also posted, usually weekly. This was our final count this year. If you add the Laysan albatross, Lao, and the black-footed albatross, b Fowl, together, you get a total of 470,164 active nests. The count was lower than some years, but the numbers do ebb and flow in a fairly consistent pattern over many years, and this was typical for a low year. Once the count was over, those of us who remained on island had a bit of spare time for some pretty fabulous beach walks, but not so much during work hours. The fish and wildlife staff and volunteers made good use of our extra bodies. Their extensive native planting project produces a constant supply of pots that need scrubbing and bleaching to avoid the risk of disease. The trays lower left and the huge white and blue containers were all salvaged from beach cleanups. Waste not, want not. Anything that can be reused is. We also helped with outplanting the native plants from those pots and almost immediately the albatross moved in and tried to pull them up. We also pulled invasive species whenever we found them. Kirsten here is I think about five foot four. This monster verbicina, once the scourge of the island, had quietly snuck up unseen in a large nalpaca bush. Another post-count task is to collect all the flags. Hunting down the flags with a GPS is a great way to learn all the sector divisions, even those we haven't personally counted in our team. Since I'm going back as a leader next season, this was particularly helpful, as I'm going to have to place the flags again before the rest of the counters arrive. Here again is that map with all the GPS points marked and a list of their coordinates on the left. I've mentioned beach cleanup. Whenever the weather was good, even on off work days, most of us got together to attack different beach areas. There's, one, uh, there's another of those vast blue containers, top left. The basket, top right, is one of dozens that wash up and are reused to collect small debris. The rope, bottom left, gained an interesting new life. Some days after we retrieved these apparently unused coils, we found an excellent use for them on another of our projects, the mouse eradication project. Fair warning, the next slide is just a little upsetting. I think all of you have heard about the awful mouse attacks that have been occurring for several seasons. This is the year that the mouse eradication will take place. At least I hope it's still going ahead given the current global crisis. It's a major project that has been ramping up for some months. This nesting adult was one of two discovered during our time there. That's far fewer than in the past. Mouse attacks were initially discovered by the nest counters in hatch year 2016, just a few specific areas. By the following season, which was the time I was first there, the attacks had dramatically increased and spread much further. Since then, staff have been spot treating and managed to reduce the attacks, but the mouse population has exploded. We had quite a role to play in the project because of the endangered Laysan ducks. Laysan ducks were almost extinct some years ago. 
and only found on Laysan Island. So a number were translocated to Midway Atoll, where they thrived. Three years ago, we were thrilled to spot just a few. This year, they're hard to miss. This success story, like the Bonins, comes with an extra, extra challenge right now, as all the ducks have to be corralled before the helicopter rodenticide drop can take place. This and the previous photo were taken by a fellow counter, a far superior photographer with a far superior camera. So we were tasked with helping to build the aviaries where the ducks would be housed for some months before, during and after the eradication. They have to be gathered early before their breeding season because once they start breeding they will tend to go into hiding, making it far more difficult for the staff to find and capture them. The frames for the aviaries were already assembled before we arrived, but we had to punch thousands of grommets into the tarps and also create zipper doorways in the white tarps that you can see on the right. These are the aviaries at various stages of construction. We very quickly ran out of the purchased lime green rope that you can see top left, and that's where the rope we recovered from the beach came in. We had to tie individual knots to back up zip ties that we were also putting in because the zip ties had failed on their test case after just a couple of months in the sun. You can see the dark green ties in the bottom left image, so those coils of rope were a great find for us. A sad casualty of the eradication project is the hydroponics greenhouse, as it will have to be completely dismantled until the end of the project. Hin, who's the tie you can see in this photo, has managed the hydroponics since the greenhouse was established about eight years ago. He produces an extensive variety of fruit and vegetables for the whole island, and residents will very much miss these fresh ingredients in their diet. Okay, it's time to focus back on the albatross. I've got some video of Laysan albatross, followed by the black-footed albatross. It's interesting to see the difference in the way they interact and their sounds, especially since we don't see the black-footed here on island. And as a contrast in both style and sound, enjoy these black-footed albatross. This clip is just over a minute, but this pair kept going for around 10 minutes. Here are a few more images, both Laysan and Blackfooted. This pair was swapping just after its chick was hatched. And here's some more raucous honking from a pair of Blackfoots. <laughs> On Midway we also see hybrids, that's the result of a black-footed and laysan mating. Typically the male is a black-footed albatross as they are significantly larger and more aggressive than the laysan. 
three years ago I did spot some walkers but no nesting hybrids though I believe they've been reported in the past. This year we recorded quite a few on nests. Also the hybrids I remembered were pretty much one shade of pale grey all over whereas this year I noticed that many have white patches and more defined eye colour like the laysun. So I'm wondering if that's a result of hybrids breeding with the laysuns over a number of generations. This was my favourite. I took many photos of it and visited its marked nest as often as I could in my last few days, hoping to see a chick, but no luck. I do know that this hybrid's mate is a laysun. This was the only kawaii banded bird I saw. Black and white bands with KP were banded on kawaii, and when I checked the band number I found this bird was likely banded as an adult during the 2004-05 season. So to have been banded as an adult, it must be at least 18 years old, and it's interesting it was banded here, but now nesting on Midway. This was the first chick we spotted on January 16th. Unusual for it to be a laysun, as the black-footed albatross typically hatch a week or two in advance of the laysun on Midway, but the blackfoot seemed to have been a little later than usual arriving this season. As you can imagine, once it was chick season, I took a huge number of chick picks. This one was so newly hatched it was still wet with shell pieces sticking on its back. And here you can see the veins in the membrane that lines the shell. Interestingly, the black-footed chicks are much whiter than the laysan when they first hatch. Again, here's a newly hatched laysan and a dry fluffy one. Here you can clearly see the temporary pip tooth on the end of its bill, which helps a chick to pip through the shell. And there's that black-footed chick again. This was a very windy day on Eastern Island. I didn't get many shots while we were working on the count, but I did enjoy capturing the birds in flight during some downtime, so here's a few. And I also often sat quietly watching pairs switching off their nests and spending a few gentle moments together. Here's an albatross I haven't mentioned yet. This is George, a short-tailed albatross. George used to be known as Lonesome George until one year he showed up with Geraldine. They're the only short-tailed pair on Midway, the only other short-tails, and there aren't many of them, are found on a group of small islands off the coast of Japan. George is huge in comparison to both Laysan and Blackfoots, but happily nests among both near the, run, near the uh, airfield. The chick you see hatched on January the 2nd, which is a lot earlier than the other albatross. The surrounding albatross often visited the chick once its parents started leaving the nest. They're very inquisitive. And here are some of the other residents on Midway. Bristle-thighed curlews, black noddies, beautiful white tern, the brown booby, where there's a puddle there's often a lace and duck party. Then the monk seals, there are quite a few monk seals around the island. The indentation bottom right was made by a resting monk seal. I placed my hat there for size, it was a big one. It's pretty obvious why this is called Turtle Beach and that beach is off limits to us unless we're working in that sector. I mentioned the Battle of Midway and the number of monuments and memorials dotted around the islands. This is the most expansive, with the central memorial surrounded by artillery and anchors, as well as several plaques. This one caught my eye. We'll hold Midway till hell freezes over. This large monument with an engraving of the battle on the central black granite slab was placed on what was the parade ground of the naval base. It's where major ceremonies are held, and if any of you saw the live streaming of the 75th anniversary, you would have recognised this. 
There are still many wartime artefacts to be seen lying around. This was on Eastern Island. We just gathered a few for the photo. The weather was particularly stormy during our first three weeks. Uh, this was the evening storm you saw in an earlier video. The beaches were badly eroded by the vicious swells from the storms. However, there was a positive side as the large swells swept much of the beach debris off the sand and up into the Nalpaca and other vegetation high up beyond the shoreline. So the beaches briefly looked surprisingly pristine and our beach cleanups became Nalpaca cleanups instead. Some nesting albatross have a pretty bad time during the storms. This one looks as if it'll be okay because of the moat around its nest. But this area was completely flooded with many abandoned eggs lying waterlogged still in their nest bowls. The storms brought some very high winds. In fact, we had to delay counting in many of the wooded areas. When we eventually counted among the trees, we did find some casualties. This one sadly didn't survive a direct strike from a falling branch. This one seems to have flown or fallen into a bone-in petrol burrow and both wings were trapped in the collapsed burrow and some tree roots. However, we were able to gently extract it. Uh, thankfully, nothing was broken and it recovered. The storms did also result in some terrific rainbows. I snapped this one on one of our rougher crossings to Eastern Island. During our time there, we also enjoyed some spectacular sunrises and sunsets. Since we can't have any Q&A on this recording, I thought you should just enjoy these extra photos. Thank you. 